Mr. Ugas, thank you very much for joining us in this studio. So my first question would be about your first impressions in Ukraine. You've met uh, President Poroshenko and some other officials. What are your general impressions of this country? Well, yesterday we met with the president and the general prosecutor, and uh, what we transmitted as a message is that there was a very relevant expectation from the population and international community of how all these new measures and instruments that have been adopted are going to be enforced. Because as we mentioned the president, uh, it is not enough nowadays where corruption is so relevant to uh, deliver instruments if they are not going to have real impact in reality. And after two years of government, we haven't seen really any uh, results on the relevant cases of corruption that are affecting Ukraine. Uh, so I also uh, remember that uh, like it is happening in Brazil, Guatemala, Honduras, and other countries around the world, uh, corruption is so relevant that is having even impact in governance and attempting against democracy in many cases. In Brazil, President Rousseff has been suspended due to corruption allegations. And the uh, president of Guatemala and the vice president are in prison because of that. And in Honduras, there are a demonstration of the people demanding the government to react. And that has generated that the OAS has created a new commission there in order to address impunity and some ministers and high level uh, officials are being investigated or are in prison because of corruption. So uh, corruption is a serious issue. I think it's in the top of the agenda of many countries in the world. Ukraine had two years ago a very serious issue that had a, a terrible outcome with uh, people dead and, and uh, a lot of violence but nothing has happened with the former president who ran away and uh, allegedly has taken billions of dollars out of Ukraine. So uh, my impression is that there's uh, frustration on the people because they don't see results. And uh, there's an expectation of if the political will that has been expressed in the speeches and in some of the measures that have been adopted by the government are going to have a concrete reflection in reality. That's basically what, I, what I've seen in, in this day and a half that I've been here. I see at the same time, during two last years, there was some progress made. Uh, one may mention Prozoro system or open registers or e-data. Uh, site and some other issues, the creation of uh, several anti-corruption bodies like NABU. Um, do you think that these instruments are efficient or could be efficient to tackle corruption on the highest level? Some of them are clearly good instruments and I'm sure that will, be, will bring a difference in the transparency and integrity agenda of the country. I understand that ProSoro is a very, uh, very relevant means in order to uh, make more transparent and competitive the public procurement. And that historically, it has been proven around the world that the, mo that the greatest amount of money that is diverted uh, for corruption happens in public acquisition. So ProSoro, I think, is a very good measure. And civil society has had a very strong input on this one. Uh, regarding the anti-corruption agencies, uh, I understand that the preventive agency hasn't been completed yet and that the Bureau has started its work, but no relevant results have been presented, at least to the public. And uh, that's what, what I mentioned when I said that uh, sometimes it's not enough to put in place the mechanisms if they don't have uh, uh, the necessary elements to, to transform reality. And in the case of the agencies, independence is the basic factor that will assure that they will have results. Independence and political will, of course. They need to be adequate budgeted and uh, have the human resources in order to deliver uh, their results. I was explaining now in a lecture I had at the university 
that the anti-corruption agency of Indonesia has 754 staff members working only on prevention of corruption. And that, of course, implies a budget and implies a political will from the government in order to assure that they will be efficient enough. Do you think it's important uh, doing all these, uh, creating all these anti-corruption uh, corruption agencies uh, to perform some results in, uh, I mean, in putting in jail or uh, persecuting some important political figures, I mean, individual, individuals who are famous for their corruption? Uh, not only creating this uh, system to avoid, to prevent corruption, but also to show some, some key figures being in jail, like in your experience in Peru, you put in jail a former president. Do you think this is important, I mean, for public, for, for people who are just uh, want to see results? Because it's difficult for, for people to see results. Well, what we said yesterday to the president and, uh, and to the general prosecutor, is that uh, they should follow the strategy designed by some anti-corruption experts that say that if you want to recover the trust of people, the first thing you need to do is to fry some big fish. If people don't see that those that have committed corrupt acts and grand corruption practices uh, uh, assume legal consequences, they, people don't believe that there's going to happen anything different. So those that feel that they are untouchable uh, that, or that they are be, uh, uh, over the law need to, need to be investigated and prosecuted and if they are found responsible should be convicted. So breaking impunity is one of the first stages of a vibrant anti-corruption process. And uh, that's what we are not seeing here. After two years of government, very little has happened. And uh, the president mentioned yesterday that uh, the, he was not receiving, or the country was not receiving cooperation from other countries that had money that has been taken out of Ukraine through corrupt means. But what we have been informed from those countries is that it's the government of Ukraine that is not cooperating with them, providing the information in order to uh, uh, obtain some, some results on the asset recovery of these ill-gotten assets and ill-gotten money that is in foreign countries. So something strange is happening here that we don't have clear messages of uh, what is really happening. What are your overall impressions of the general uh, prosecutor? Well, I just met him yesterday for some minutes, so I cannot have uh, a, a real impression of, and I don't want to speculate about that. Uh, the thing is that he has a huge challenge. He, he mentioned yesterday that in some months from now he's committed to present some results to the country and uh, we expect that that will really happen. Uh, yesterday I was misquoted by the president's office saying that Transparency International said that Ukraine was the most transparent country in the world. And I didn't say that. I just quoted a Ukrainian that said that in the London summit. And uh, I also mentioned that uh, to be the most transparent country in the world, you also need to produce results. The other thing is that uh, that statement said that uh, Transparency International will bring the assets to Ukraine that were stolen by Yanukovych. And that's not our duty. That's the government's duty. What we said is that Transparency International is willing to support all the efforts of the, of, of the government in order to make it possible. And we offered to put them in contact with some other authorities and through our chapters that are in other countries where this money has been taken. But uh, we, we act in these cases like facilitators, but it's not our responsibility to uh, uh, act on behalf of the government because that's a duty that the authorities of this country have to, have to uh, uh, make possible. Yeah, surely enough, Ukraine is not the most transparent country in the world. And speaking about that, uh, we know that in rankings of uh, Transparency International, Ukraine's place is quite low. It is 130 in this year and it was 144 in the previous year. 
despite all the efforts done in this direction, I mean all this anti-corruption bureau, Prozoro system and all the stuff, what are the criteria? Could you explain why it's so and what could be done to improve the place of Ukraine in this ranking? Because it's important for the image of the country abroad. Yeah, uh, first of all, we need to understand that the CPI, the Corruption Perception Index, measures perceptions, first of all. Secondly, uh, it is not a survey done by Transparency International. What we do is we go into each country and we collect information that has been produced by uh, very uh, reputable agencies that do local survey, uh, surveys. So we need f at least four surveys per country in order to build this indicator. So it is not constructed by us, but we take the information that is produced by, by others, uh, serious agencies, and then we apply our formula and produce the result. Uh, I think it's not so relevant to see if Ukraine is in the position number 144 or 146 or 80. What is really relevant is the score that the country receives. So we rate the countries from zero to 100. 100 meaning zero corruption, and zero meaning a lot of corruption, too much corruption or absolute corruption. So uh, Ukraine is now, for 2015, uh, rated with 27 points out of 100, and that is a very bad position in the general rank. And historically, the country hasn't moved too much, maybe two points down, one point up, from last year to, to this year, but that's no good news. I mean, 27 out of 100 is a scenario where the people or the companies that have been surveyed believe and perceive that there's still a big amount of corruption in Ukraine. I have heard from several uh, uh, analysts or, or leaders of opinion that they believe that corruption is systemic here it's embedded in the political class, and uh, therefore some major structural reform is needed in order to change that situation. And that is possible. There are countries around the world that have improved with adequate political uh, decisions. You know, Africa is considered one of the continents with more corruption in the world, like Asia and uh, Latin America to some extent. But then you have countries like Botswana, that has a very, very good performance in our CPI. And it is basically because they had good governments that took adequate decisions, and they have reduced significantly the occurrence of corruption and grand corruption in the reality. You have Georgia near to Ukraine, and Georgia had a huge improvement when they started the reform of the police. As a matter of fact, the president yesterday mentioned that one of his achievements was the reform of the Ukrainian police. He said not on efficiency, because apparently the police is not uh, at the level of efficiency that the government is expecting, but in terms of corruption, petty corruption, request of bribes, there has been an improvement taking the Georgian reform as a model. So uh, that explains that it is possible to bring change and generate uh, some uh, positive transformation in institutions here. We do know that judiciary reform is one of the most important because it reform police is quite simple task. I mean, to reform petrol police was been done in Ukraine, but then we had to reform all the courts or judiciary system, and this is a huge problem. Um, do you think it's possible? Can you provide some successful examples some other countries who tackled cr corruption successfully in judiciary with, with success? Kind of models that Ukraine can adopt. Yeah, there's, there's a lot written about this. There are the Bangalore principles, there are the principles that should be on the base of any efficient uh, uh, judicial system. And as I said before, one of the main principles of Bangalore is the independence of the judiciary, how judges and prosecutors are appointed without political interference and the profile of independent actors for the judiciary and the prosecutorial offices is, is uh, basic. 
So uh, there, there are several experiences around the world. I just will mention two. One is what is happening in Brazil, where a group of prosecutors and judges, like Judge Moro uh, from Curitiba, had made, has made an enormous difference in the way corruption is addressed in uh, the Brazilian courts. Now you have in prison the CEOs of the top companies of Brazil. One year ago, nobody would imagine that someone like Marcelo Odebrecht, who is the CEO of this huge company called Odebrecht, or the CEOs of OAS, Andrade Gutierrez, Camargo Correa, and other big companies are now in prison. Odebrecht has been convicted to 20 years in prison. And he started to talk, and he's seeking an agreement with the prosecutors. Uh, 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 to the point that the political regime of Brazil is shaking because of this case. So that means that even though there's a lot of corruption in Brazil, systemic too, and a lot of corruption in the judicial system, there's always a moral reserve, like these courageous prosecutors that are uh, 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 working on the, on the Petrobras case and, and the judges, of course. So that's, that's a proof that it is possible within the same system to produce a change and generate some significant results. The other model is a model of Guatemala, where United Nations created this commission called CICIC, the Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, and they brought external forces. There's the chief of the CICIC is a type of international prosecutor with a team of 50 more or less investigators that, come, that has come from all around the world that are investigating cases in Guatemala with the Attorney General's office and producing evidence that then they present to the judges in the context of the criminal cases. Well, they have had huge achievements to the point that the President and the Vice President of Guatemala are in prison and they have solved uh, a emblematic cases of corruption and violence in that country. So when the judiciary and the, and the attorney general's office is not in the capacity to uh, work seriously on corrupt cases, then a possibility is considering bringing external support from international bodies or, or, or institutions that can help to construct the local capacity, but at the same time to contribute to the solution of these cases. Mm -hmm. I see another successful example is your own example, your own example in Peru, where you managed to put into jail the president of the country, the former president of the country, without any uh, international help, if I'm not mistaken. Could you comment on this experience of yours, what was important for you and how you managed, uh, being, you've been appointed to your position by the president and sometime later you put him into jail? Well, the Peruvian case that happened 15 years ago uh, probably was one of the first that happened uh, in the region uh, and it probably is, is relevant for two reasons. The first one is that the Peruvian case expressed the capture of the state by a criminal network that was led by Fujimori and his personal advisor, Vladimiro Montesinos. Uh, so it was not a case of widespread corruption of some high level officials involved in corrupt practice, practices, but it was a criminal network organized from the highest levels of government that took over the entire state, the judiciary, the Congress, the electoral court, uh, uh, the police, the armed forces, everything. Even in the private sector, they had control of the media. All the channels of TV were under their control except one. The, all the written media except two. So it, it was a huge operation of organized crime. The second feature that distinguishes the Peruvian case from others is that in our case everything was taped. Everything was on video because Montesinos had this <laughs> uh, uh, practice of, of taping everything. So we found hundreds of videos where all these corrupt practices were there and we could, we could uh, 
saw them and, and hear them. So uh, what happened after that is that I think we built a successful case because we had the political will of a transitional government. There was a transitional government that came and really gave us support for that. But before the transitional government, you are right, we that were appointed by Fujimori started six days after an investigation against him when we obtained evidence that he would probably be involved in money laundering cases. Uh, how was this possible? Because we were uh, uh, retained in order to represent the Peruvian state, not to represent the Peruvian president. And that's what I told the minister when he called me and said that the president was concerned that I was saying I was going to investigate him. And he told me, you are his lawyer and you shouldn't be talking against your client. And I said, no, no, this is a mistake. He's not my client. He signed my appointment on behalf of the Peruvian state. My client is the state, not the government. And three days after, he left the country and flew to Japan. So uh, I think it was uh, an interesting process in the sense that the entire organization was disbanded and we were able to bring into justice uh, hundreds of people. I mean, 1,500 people were investigated during the first 14 months and then that number escalated to 2,500 and we recovered around $350 million from abroad. So, uh, but that demonstrates that when there is political will, and, and a good team of people like our judges and our prosecutors working in these specific cases, uh, young people, not tainted, highly motivated, uh, results are possible. And probably my last question, and probably the most difficult one, speaking about this fight against corruption, uh, we have to consider sustainability. How to achieve sustainable results, because the system has a tendency to, to rebuild itself, and how to, to, to get the results visible and sustainable in time. We need to transform institutions. The anti-corruption work is not only going against the bad guys. That's relevant in order to break impunity and, and generate legal consequences, but that will not solve the problem. If we bring Yanukovych to this country and we convict him uh, uh, for uh, life uh, imprisonment sentence, that will not solve the problem of corruption in Ukraine. That will be a good start, of course. But you need to change institutions and to change structures because then another corrupt will come and will benefit of this inadequate way of structuring the country. So the, the only way to assure sustainability is producing real transformation on the structures and the culture of the people. If the people don't understand that living with corrupt practices is, is not good for the health of the country, increases poverty, increases inequality, generates problems of governance, then uh, sustainable change will not be possible. So there's also an educational challenge here on the preventive side uh, to understand that we can live with integrity, with honesty, and in a better environment for the common good of all the people.